This headlight's not working anymore, but it's not because it has a bad bulb. It's because they wired it with the wrong connectors. These are designed for household use and not for automotive. So what is the best connector to use for automotive? Well, today we're gonna find out. I bought all of the most popular connectors and I'm gonna test them to see what's the cleanest and strongest connection. And whichever one wins, we're gonna put on this truck. Let's find out. The test wire that we're using today is 14 gauge pre-tinned copper wire. I'm cutting them all to the same length because we're going to be testing these circuits individually and they need to be identical. I'm going to shorten up the depth on the wire strippers so I can get these wires stripped for the connectors that I'm using today. This is the wire nut that we took off of the headlight circuit. Let's put this one together first. The benefit here is you can just screw this nut on without using any tools but I suspect it's not going to make as good of a connection as some of the others. Next we've got these lever wire nuts which came from Amazon. I've got no experience with them. I can't wait to test these. And of course my all-time favorite. These are the crimp and seal butt connectors. I've been using these for a long time, but the problem comes from how you crimp them. Crimping tools come with two sides, one for insulated and one for non-insulated connectors. The non-insulated side is obviously a stronger connection, but it'll break that insulation, which you never want to do because you'll end up with a short circuit. But even if you use the correct insulated side of the crimpers, you have to use just enough force to crimp it, but not so much that you're going to damage the connector. Now we can use the heat gun to shrink down that tubing and it'll also release some of that sealant so that you have a nice watertight seal. But if you did it wrong that heat will expose the damage that you've done and you've got to do it all over again. So let's try this again a little bit less crimping and that should be good right there. Add more heat. We'll shrink it down. Now we can inspect it. This looks way better. Let's go ahead and use this one. Now these connectors are what you need for the non-insulated side of your crimpers. This is a non-insulated butt connector. Still goes together the same way, but this side of the tool is really gonna bite down hard into that metal and I can squeeze with a lot of effort and give it a really good dimple. I think this connection is going to do really well when we test the tensile strength of these connections. Now, of course, you've gotta add your own insulation to a connection like this, but they come in a good variety pack. So you just slide that tube on there and it'll shrink down and give you a really nice seal. Now, the next one is every car stereo installer's favorite connector and that's the Scotch Lock. The benefit here is you can add a wire to an existing circuit and you don't have to cut any wires to do that. So it works pretty well in theory. You just squeeze that blade down over your wires which strips them and it connects them together. Close it up and theoretically you have a good connection. Next up is a crimp wire nut. You just twist your wires together, put the nut on top and you crimp it down. Just like the Scotch Lock, this is not a waterproof connection, so it's for indoor use only. For the last two splices, we're setting our wire strippers a little bit longer, so we've got more exposed wire to deal with here. This is gonna be your standard mesh and twist wire splice. Add a little bit of flux to the connection so that the solder flows nice and smooth. We've got a nice clean soldering iron, and I tin the tip of it so I can transfer the heat a little bit better to the connection. Now it's nice and hot, we can flow some solder into there, and of course, we'll insert insulate it with some heat shrink. The last method we're using is called the lineman splice. Now this is going to be just like the mesh and twist because we're using solder. But this connection is going to be stronger. So we're wrapping the wires around each other and then we'll twist them on the opposite side. This is going to be a little bit of a thicker connection, so it will make for a bulkier wire harness, but once we get it over to the test bench, I think it's gonna to prove to be a lot stronger than that mesh and twist. So we're gonna measure how much force it takes to break all of these connectors, but first, let's measure how much resistance is in each of these connections. The only way to tell how well a current can move through a circuit is to load that circuit, so that's what we're going to do today with the light bulb. Let's use this circuit as an example. If I put a probe on either side of the light bulb, the voltmeter would read 12 volts. But that's only in this example. In the real world, we've got resistance in the wire and in the connections. So what you're actually going to see is a reading that's somewhere near 12 volts, but not exactly. Today we're going to find out exactly how much resistance is in those connections by putting our probes on the same leg of the circuit. So going back to this perfect example, if we put the probes here and here, the voltage reading we should get is zero volts. But what you'll actually get is something in the millivolts range. The reading that you get in millivolts is what we call voltage drop. 
and the higher the number, the worse that connection is. So we're looking for a low number in our testing today. Each one of the connectors that we're testing is attached to this bus bar and that goes back to the negative side of the battery. One side of the light bulb is connected directly to the positive side of the battery and the other side is where we're attaching it to each one of the connectors. So the twist splice has a voltage drop of 86.8 millivolts. Let's move on to the lineman splice. Looks like it's slightly better at 86.6, but that's essentially a tie. Crimp and seal is next. This is the one I've been using for a really long time and 87.6 is a good showing for them. Here's the non-insulated butt connector and it just beats out the crimp and seal. 87.2 millivolts, pretty good. Time to place your bets on the scotch lock. I don't think it's gonna do too well. And it doesn't. 89 millivolts is the worst showing yet. And it looks like it can't even beat the crimp nut, which comes in just under the scotch lock at 88.2 millivolts. And time to test the Amazon Special. This lever butt connector actually just slightly worse than the scotch lock, moving to the bottom of the barrel. Last but not least, the wire nut that we got off of the headlight, and it actually moves up to the middle of the pack to number five. Not a bad showing for the old wire nut. For you cynics in the comments section that are wondering why I was testing the entire ground side of the circuit instead of just across the connection? Well, it's because it's easier. So just for you, we'll test these two connections here to see what the voltage drop is just across the connection. Looks like the twist splice is pretty good. The voltage drop is only 4.3 millivolts. Now let's go to the other end of the spectrum. We'll test the lever butt connector. Across that connection, we've got 8.1 millivolts, which is about double the voltage drop. Now it's time to have some fun. We're gonna break all of these connectors using, well, this weird looking rig here. I've got a scale on there to see how much tensile strength each one of these connectors has. This connection strength is going to be very important in automotive applications because you've got so many moving parts. Plus, when you're working on stuff, you need to move it out of your way and you don't want to break stuff while you're doing that. All right, we've got one end attached to the scale. Now, if I can just get this eagle grip adjusted just right, we can attach that to the bench and we can get started here. Don't let me forget this electrical tape. I remember on the headlight connection, they had a couple pieces of electrical tape just sort of wrapped around that wire nut. So let me do that because this is science. We want our testing methods to be as accurate as possible. All right, the scale's ready. Our setup is good to go. Let's go ahead and start pumping this jack until we start seeing a little bit of a move. There it is. We've got 0.4 pounds. Let's see how high we can get it before this thing breaks. And it looks like a whopping 7.6 pounds is all it took to break that connection. All right, let's go with the Amazon Special now. This is that lever butt connector. Wrap it around here a few times and start pumping the jack. Looks like it went up to eight pounds before it started coming down and it finally let loose. All right, this crimp nut is our next victim. Let's put this on the rack and see how far we can stretch it. Looks like 13.2 pounds is what it took to get this thing to break and it's uh, pulling into the lead. I'm shocked. All right, Scotch Lock is up next. I honestly don't have high hopes for this thing. It can't hold on very much, can it? Let's find out. 12, two, about 12.2 pounds. Not bad, not bad, it moves into second place. All right, here comes a big heavyweight contender here. This is the non-insulated butt connector. Now, if you remember, I was able to use the non-insulated side of the crimper, which I think is gonna make this a very strong connection. Oh, Let's see how much we can go. 21. It's already easily in first place, going over 30 pounds so far. This is pretty amazing. Let's keep going. 40. 48. And 50. We just passed 50. It's almost 60 now. Yep, there it is. 60 pounds. You can see the wire stretching because sometimes the scale is showing a lower number as it stretches. But we're gonna move this thing all the way to failure. So let's see how high we can get. It's almost hitting 70 pounds now. There it goes, over 70. Let's keep going. 75.9 is the highest I saw. It's starting to come down now. There it goes. It just snapped. Over 75 pounds on the scale easily puts the non-insulated butt connector far and away in first place. Let's see what the crimp and seal can do compared to that. This crimp and seal's always been my go-to connector, but 
After seeing what the non-insulated can do, I'm having my doubts as to whether I'm going to keep using these. And in a shockingly poor performance, the crimp and seal butt connector ends up in fifth place behind the scotch lock. Now it's actually time for the lineman splice. This is actually designed to be stronger than the wire itself, so I have a feeling that it's going to take a lot of pulling to get this thing to break. Let's see what it does. Easily over 20 pounds. Now it's got over 30 and 40 pounds, but it looks like that is just starting to stretch. It's like the number goes up and it comes back down. It's so we barely hit 50 pounds and the scale is coming back down now. So some part of this connection is stretching. Wow, we're over 70 pounds now, almost 80. There it is, 80 pounds. That, oh, there it broke. Ooh, there it went. What was that? Like oh, look at that. Five. The lineman splice stayed intact and it broke from down here. So 88 pounds and change, almost hitting 90 pounds. The lineman splice did not fail until the wire itself actually failed. So that twist splice is gonna have some really big shoes to fill. Let's see if it can come anywhere near that lineman splice. This is the point where it's already beaten the non-insulated butt connector and we keep on going. I'm really impressed by the strength of these connections. I honestly didn't think it would be that strong, but it is. Let's see how far we can oh keep God, going it's here. Coming, it's coming out of the insulation. Man, it's crazy town. 90, I hit 90. Oh, there it goes. That is amazing. 99.4 is the actual number I saw, the last one on the scale before it broke. Nearly a hundred pounds of force before the wire broke and the splice did not fail just like the lineman splice. So both of these soldered connections are tied for first place now. There's no way to tell how strong the connections actually are because the wire broke first. What an amazing finish for these two. All right, that was pretty exciting. We used science to actually figure out what's best mechanically and electrically. And it turns out in both cases, it's going to be the lineman splice or the twist splice. Neither one of these failed before the wire did, which is pretty dang awesome. And we've got the best electrical connectivity. But if you're not gonna be soldering stuff like on a car, get those non-insulated cramp. Look at that, 75 pounds plus it's very good conductivity. Way better than the crimp and seal. It's 62 pounds more strong than the crimp and seal. It's amazing. So send this video to your know-it-all uncle who says, oh, I'm just gonna use wire nuts because they're fine. It was terrible. One and a half pounds, it was the worst one we had by far. And once you send him this video, go over and watch this one over here. That's going to be why our relays numbered the way that they are. I had to research it myself because I didn't know, but it's really cool to know these things. I'll see you over there. Thanks for watching.